the ultimate book on yoga all that you want to know about yoga the complete book is over 11 hours long here are some interesting snippets this book looks at this wide spectrum of practices that span over thousands of years and survive even to this day though transformed to a large extent the main motivating factor in all these practices is the strong human longing to get into domains that are beyond mundane in this book i neither try to unify these divergent systems nor push for any single system of yoga my idea is to pick good things from each of these systems and come up with a set of practices that may be generally beneficial to everyone no matter what their goal is i have chosen patanjali yoga as the main thread around which i discuss various related aspects i have chosen patanjali yoga as a central theme both because it is holistic and has the backing of thousands of years of heritage moreover it is the most logical system as compared to many later developments i have tried to cater for people with varying interests health enhancement stress reduction improving mental capabilities spiritual experiences as well as advanced insights into ancient indian philosophical thoughts the discussion blends practical methods with analytical thinking and finally spiritual insights i have also tried to develop the discussion around a sound logical and scientific framework free from mysticism more specifically i have given a neuroscience based analysis of the complete yoga system this enables us to scientifically study yoga and attain greater clarity such a clarity can not only make yoga more effective but also prevent degeneration of yoga my main interest in yoga is as a healer to most of our current day ills be it widespread violence deprivation intolerance or inequality this may surprise someone who is used to thinking yoga as merely a health enhancer at personal level my claim is that yoga is a health enhancer not only at individual level but also an enhancer of the health of the society as a whole i'm not talking only in terms of physical health but also psychological intellectual as well as spiritual health this may appear to be a wishful thinking but i firmly believe that a well understood and implemented yoga system in its original form has the potential to do that Chapter 1 How to be happy Sometimes I get amazed by the rat race that goes on in the name of enjoyment people go to any extent to enjoy for many people enjoyment is the very purpose of their life I am not against enjoyment per se I am not like those ancient buddhists who looked at enjoyment as a cause of all miseries they advocated shunning all worldly enjoyment but they frowned only upon worldly enjoyment they had no problem with the enjoyment or bliss one experiences as a result of meditative practices buddhism shunned worldly enjoyment and advocated a life of renunciation probably because of the extremities the mankind had ventured into in those days the society was war torn and there was widespread killing buddha appeared on this earth when india was riddled with bloodshed driven by extreme greed the then prince ajata shatru killed his own father to ascend the throne he even conspired to kill buddha but buddha reformed even such a person by his sane advice and finally 
अजात शत्रु रिनाउंस एक्सट्रीमिटीज बुद्धा वॉन्टेड टू लिमिट दिस एक्सट्रीमिटी टेकन बाय द मैन काइंड दैट वुड अल्टीमेटली लीड दैम टू ग्रेट मिसरी ही केम अप विद दिस फोर नोबल ट्रूथ्स वन ऑफ विच आइडेंटिफाइज अनकंट्रोल्ड डिजायर for enjoyment as the root cause of all miseries so he advocated total shunning of worldly enjoyment as a remedy the vedic rules to which buddha belonged never advocated complete shunning of enjoyment in fact kama or worldly enjoyment was one of the four attainables for any person the other three being dharma the righteousness artha or the acquisition of wealth and moksha or complete liberation from worldly tangles but there was a way to do it a person was first supposed to study righteousness or dharma that governed both the individual's life as well as the individual's participation in the society as a whole once a person has mastered the dharma then and only then he was allowed to earn a livelihood again earning without violating the norms laid by the dharma or the righteousness that was artha or wealth once a man was well established in the society as a responsible individual he was entitled to enjoy the world in a righteous way that was kama or enjoyment after enjoying as long as he wanted and as long as the body permitted and most importantly without transgressing the limits set by the righteousness or dharma one could choose to aspire for complete liberation from all entanglements that was moksha in this way dharma righteousness artha wealth kama enjoyment moksha final liberation were the four attainables one should aspire for as per the ancient indian way of living the emphasis was on a responsible way of living both as an individual as well as part of a healthy society at least in buddha's case he went through the study of dharma in his early life he was a prince who inherited lot of wealth so there was no need for him to earn wealth he got married and even had a son but finally at the age of 40 he decided to renounce the worldly life to work for the betterment of the society and also for his own final emancipation his own emphasis on the last achievable namely moksha may not have been meant for all the people this was exactly what sage yajnavalkya in the upanishadic story that we narrated earlier was planning to do in ancient india the life of an individual was divided into four quarters each spanning 25 years in the first 25 years one was supposed to study dharma at that time one lived with his teachers in gurukulas or residential schools during this time worldly enjoyment was completely forbidden one needed to focus completely on studies alone no part time jobs no dating or partying as we see students nowadays engaged in only after one completes the studentship one was eligible for earning as well as enjoyment but again within the limits of righteousness he was entitled to get married raise a family and live a comfortable worldly life he played an active role in the society helping fellow beings that was the stage after the first 25 years and for the next 25 years from 50 to 75 was the transition period when one prepared for a graceful exit from active worldly life during this time one entered what is called vanaprastha or forest dweller stage during that time he and his wife lived in the forest along with such other couple subsisting on whatever is naturally available in the forest they were supposed to gradually prepare for detaching themselves from the society 
and move towards spiritual life. Only at the fag end of one's life, that is between the age 75 to 100, one had the option to work on liberation or moksha. But it is not necessary for all to attempt moksha. They can continue in forest dweller stage till their death. But what are we doing today? The word righteousness has lost its meaning. Anything that is right for me is our definition of righteousness. Enjoyment has become the only goal. But there is difference between enjoying and enjoying responsibly. Otherwise, we become no different from animals that are totally driven by instinct with no ability to think. This theme flows in all ancient Indian scriptures and was once the Indian way of life. One of the Upanishads, namely the Isha Vasya Upanishad, says that one should aspire to live for full hundred years enjoying life. But one should keep doing one's duty as well as avoid overindulgence. One should not hoard wealth, nor one should snatch someone else's share. After all, the entire world belongs not to you alone, but to everyone or to the creator of everyone. It is the same message one sees in the Bhagavad Gita. Even the yoga propounded by Patanjali starts off within the same setting. The enjoyment talked about in the above verse was worldly enjoyment which is physical. That is derived either through the body or through the mind. But that's not all. Enjoyment beyond body and mind. All of us are familiar with the enjoyment that we derive using our various senses and organs. We also enjoy through intellectual pursuits. But most ancient Indian philosophers talked about enjoyment that is beyond body and mind. They called it ananda or bliss. This bliss does not depend on physical objects nor on mental activity. So, in a way, it is limitless. Anyone who has had a taste of this bliss looks down on bodily or mental enjoyments. He does not go after them. He remains content with this bliss. Many a times, even if the body is in a bad condition, there does not seem to be any effect on this bliss. It continues as if nothing has happened. The body would suffer, of course, but it does not affect the person. In the Upanishads, one comes across the story of one sage named Raikwa, who always used to be in such a high state of bliss. His body used to be sore with infected wounds. He lay on a broken cart, but he was ever blissful. When the local king Janushruti wanted to know the secret of his untainted bliss, Raikwa even refused to look at the king. He rejected all the riches that the king offered to him. He had no use for them. He was content with his bliss. One comes across a story in Indian philosopher Shankara's life when he meets a supposedly mad man. This man always used to be happy with apparently no reason. He used to run around singing with joy rolling on the ground with ecstasy. People thought he was mad. But when Shankara saw him, he at once recognized the high state of the mind this supposedly mad man was in. Shankara accepted him as his disciple. He later became one of the well-known disciples of Shankara. Buddha explains the cause of such immense bliss. He says that, it is an indication of a calm mind that experiences bliss with no reason at all. Most of the time, we submerge this bliss by our mental agitation. When one meditates, the mind gradually calms down and one starts experiencing this unalloyed bliss which is beyond body and mind. We will be seeing more on this later when we discuss meditation. 
Is there something more than this bliss? Even this bliss has an end since the mind cannot remain calm for long. Once the mind starts working again, it steals away all the bliss and starts looking for enjoyment in worldly things. One way to attain eternal bliss is to know one's true self. That is what the Upanishads declare. When his wife Maitreyi asks sage Yajnavalkya in the Brahdaranyaka Upanishad, what can give her eternal bliss? Yajnavalkya tells her that the true bliss lies in knowing one's real self. That is the ultimate realization talked about by yoga. Once that ultimate realization is attained, one enjoys eternal bliss. Yoga has this beyond the worldly aspect. It does not just give you worldly enjoyment in terms of better health, lesser stress, good mental focus and bliss beyond body and mind. It takes you even beyond. It takes you to a state where any other enjoyment looks trivial. In this book, I will take you through all these aspects of yoga in a gradual fashion. So, don't be content with trivial gains of yoga such as fitness and health. They are important, but don't stop at them. Explore beyond. There is a vast treasure house waiting ahead. Chapter 3 how to minimize stress. Most research studies indicate that yoga reduces stress. Lower stress means lesser chance of getting into many health problems that we discussed in the previous section. Actually, you don't need to recollect the previous section. This list of health problems includes almost all illnesses known to us today. How does yoga achieve stress reduction? Recall the three essential things to experience stress that we discussed in a previous section. Let me recapitulate them here. To experience stress, the following should happen. 1. There has to be rapid neural activity in the brain either because of an external event or that generated internally by our thoughts. The latter is of interest to us. 2. We need to pay attention to this activity. 3. Concerned brain centers need to judge this activity as harmful to us. Yoga has mechanisms through which first two of the conditions can be handled in our favor. Our thoughts can be positive or negative. By positive, I mean those thoughts that get interpreted as non-threatening to our existence and obviously the negative thoughts are just the opposite. The strange thing about our thoughts is that they multiply rapidly by interactions among like thoughts. At the same time, positive thoughts suppress negative thoughts and vice versa depending on which are stronger. One way to reduce stress is to minimize the causes of negative thoughts so that we will end up with fewer negative thoughts. This would give an upper hand to the positive thoughts and our stress gets reduced. The first step of yoga, namely yama, has ingredients that attempt to achieve this. What is this yama all about? In the following sections, I will discuss about yama in a greater detail. I will adopt an anecdote-driven approach while explaining various aspects of yoga rather than following a rigid formal approach. That would make things clearer and easier to understand. Patanjali in his Yoga Sutra lists Ahimsa as the first to do in his set of do's and don'ts, namely Yama. Ahimsa literally means non-violence not indulging in harm to others. The way the word Ahimsa is defined in Yoga Sutra is as follows. Not betraying any being at any time in any form is Ahimsa. 
अहिंसा सर्वथा सर्वदा सर्वभूतानाम अनभिद्रोह योग सूत्र 2.30 एज पर द कमेंटेटर व्यासा द ऑपोजिट ऑफ अहिंसा इज हिंसा दैट इज वॉयलेंस पतंजलि कंसिडर्स वॉयलेंस एज सम फॉर्म ऑफ बिट्रेयल द्रोह हिंसा इज नॉट रिस्ट्रिक्टेड टू ह्यूमन बीइंग्स अलोन सिंस इट सेज एनी बीइंग नॉर इट्स इट रिस्ट्रिक्टेड टू फिजिकली हर्टिंग समवन सिंस इट सेज एनी फॉर्म इट आल्सो सेज ऑल द टाइम most religions think of only human beings when they talk about non violence they think that killing an animal does not constitute himsa they think that all beings except humans are created for our consumption and so we think that there is nothing wrong in killing them we slaughter animals without thinking about the violence meted out to them and most of the time this slaughter is not essential if you are a bit more sensitive you take comfort in believing that you have somehow minimized violence caused to the slaughtered animals by adopting certain humane ways in modern sophisticated abattoirs a single bullet is shot at the animal and in a fraction of a second the animal is dead even before it knows what is happening it probably feels no pain at all and you think that you committed no violence but that does not satisfy patanjali's definition of ahimsa no matter how you kill them you are snatching their right to exist that is the biggest betrayal and the pain that you can cause every being wants to live on it is not just about physical assault or killing all forms of violence are considered to be wrong and to be avoided that brings up the most important question can we ever practice such a value even if we turn into vegetarians don't we eat plants and their produce even plants have life and they too may have feelings are we not snatching their right to live in addition to harming them how about a fisherman or a butcher who lives by killing even though he has no enmity with the fishes or any animal if he does not kill he probably cannot survive since that could be his only livelihood what about a soldier engaged in protecting his country he has to retaliate and kill the enemy if needed is he wrong yoga sutra is aware of all these possibilities it advises that if one can avoid all kinds of himsa at all times under all circumstances then that is the best it is some ideal that we have to attempt to reach probably what yoga sutra means to say is that one should try to avoid himsa to the extent possible when unavoidable indulging in himsa becomes acceptable under those circumstances so probably the best way to define ahimsa is shun avoidable violence if something is unavoidable then you will be doing ahimsa in a restricted way even though you have done himsa so a soldier killing his enemy as part of his duty or a butcher killing an animal for his livelihood can be seen as ahimsa in a restricted form only thing is that one should make every attempt to avoid violence chapter 4 how do yoga postures improve health most of us take to yoga with a goal to enjoy good health yoga postures or asana as they are called are believed to help us in improving our health whatever may be the reality at least some of the asanas we know of today as belonging to yoga did form part of hatha yoga which was propagated by the nath mystics of the 12th to 15th century ad probably modern teachers kept adding more and more asanas 
and gave impressive Sanskrit names to them to make them sound archaic. Hatha Yoga declares asana as the real first step of yoga. Hatha Pradipika, the 15th century text of Hatha Yoga, lists health, stability and flexibility as the benefits of performing the asana. That is something close to the way asanas are looked at today. Hatha Pradipika also says that some of the asanas strengthen the spine so that in later stages of Hatha Yoga practice, the mystic force Kundalini can pass through the spinal pathway without any obstruction. Hatha Pradipika describes 15 asanas that are useful in raising the mystic force Kundalini up the spine. That is the reason why Hatha Yoga gives so much importance to body postures. These body postures are mostly sitting postures. Now there are some puzzling observations. Patanjali is believed to be belonging to 200 BC. Patanjali's Yoga Sutra did not mention about any specific asana. Hatha Pradipika which came in the 15th century mentions 15 sitting asanas. Later texts such as Gheranda Samhita added some more asanas to this list. But we don't find the mention of many of the body postures known today in any of these texts. That means the asanas we know today as part of yoga are of recent origin. Chapter 5 How to Sharpen Mental Concentration Let me start with a nice little story. This is a story from Ramakrishna Paramahamsa, the guru of Swami Vivekananda. Once a sannyasi went to visit a rich man. The sannyasi was told that the rich man was busy performing his daily rituals, worshipping various gods. The sannyasi was asked to wait outside. The sannyasi had to pass time, so what he did was to dig a hole in the garden. Every time the rich man concluded worshipping one god and moved on to another god, the sannyasi also started digging another new hole. So, by the time the rich man completed his worship to all the gods, the sannyasi too had dug several holes all over the garden. Finally, the rich man came out. He looked at what the sannyasi had done. So many holes! He exclaimed to the sannyasi, If only you had dug a single hole instead of so many, by now you could have found underground water and that would have made a nice well. Basically, the rich man was pointing out at the futility of digging so many holes instead of a single hole which would have been more useful. The sannyasi merely looked at the rich man and calmly said, Yes. If only you had worshipped a single god, instead of so many, the god would have appeared before you. Many a times, we dilute our energies by trying to focus on several things simultaneously. We lack clarity and keep hopping between things. That is one of the main reasons why our efforts often don't bear fruits. But look at any successful man. He focuses completely on a single goal and he achieves that. Single-pointed dedication to whatever we do is the key to our success. But most of us are unable to do that. Our minds are restless and often keep jumping around like monkeys. Our mind can't focus on one thing. It keeps hopping around. Developing a sharp focus needs some training. If you develop such a focused mind, then you can efficiently utilize your time and effort on that goal and achieve success. A focused mind also helps in thwarting unwanted thoughts. As we discussed previously, the main cause of our stress and hence our health problems is the restlessness of our mind. We are often unable to focus on thoughts that help us and 
we tend to get lost in an avalanche of thoughts that take us nowhere, that causes stress. But if we develop a focused mind, then you can guide the thoughts in a more useful way. You can weed out all negative thoughts that hamper our progress and make our lives miserable. In Trataka, you keep staring at any small object without batting your eyelids. Obviously, after some time, the eyes get tired and you have to close your eyes. Giving a brief pause, start all over again and keep repeating this process. During that period, your mind will be well focused. No other thoughts would enter your mind. Instead of focusing on any object, more effective way would be to focus on a burning flame, say that of a candle or an oil lamp. I personally feel that an oil lamp is better. There are certain things you need to keep in mind. 1. It is better to do this practice in a dark place with no lights around other than the burning candle or the lamp. This would minimize distractions. 2. The place where you do this practice has to be free of any strong breeze. A breeze can waver the flame and again distract your attention. 3. The flame should be at least 5 to 6 feet from you. This is to ensure that you stare it with eyes narrowly open, so you feel relaxed. 4. Do the practice in a seated posture. You can choose any of the seated postures that you are comfortable with. You can sit in Padmasana, Vajrasana, Sukhasana and so on. But make sure that the back is straight, head and neck are aligned with the torso. This is to prevent you from feeling sleepy. 5. The center of the flame should be approximately in line with the line of sight so that you neither have to raise your eyeballs nor lower them. This eliminates strain on the eyes. Keep staring as long as you comfortably can without batting the eyelids. In the beginning, you may find it difficult to hold it for long. Don't strain yourself too much. Close it for a moment if you need to and give some rest to the eyes. Open the eyes and start the exercise all over again. You can do this exercise for say few minutes and gradually increase it to 10 or 20 minutes a day. But don't overdo it. Chapter 6 How to Meditate Many people think of meditation as something that one does sitting cross-legged with the eyes closed. Many meditation teachers ask you to calm your mind while doing that. They may even suggest you to give yourself some auto-suggestions, some bright light shining inside your forehead or some mystic force field engulfing you and so on. No, meditation is not just that. You can turn anything you do into meditation. In fact, you can be meditating all the time. There is an interesting description of the last moments of Buddha's life in the ancient Buddhist texts, namely the Tipitakas. Apparently, Buddha went through severe illness as his end approached. Probably he was poisoned. He was too weak and frail and was lying under a tree. Buddha knew that he was going to die any moment. But even in such a state, it is said, Buddha was calmly observing each stage of the approaching death, the feelings those stages created and the last moments of his life. And that too is meditation. By definition, meditation is anything that you do by continuously focusing your mind on some object. Patanjali defines it as prolonged and continuous dharana. Dharana is keeping your mental focus on the chosen object. Before we proceed further, 
let me clear some misconceptions. There are gurus who say that one should control the thoughts to attain a calm mind. I am afraid such a thing is never possible. As you may have often experienced, more you try to control the thoughts, more you would be flooded by them. That is because by the act of controlling the thoughts, you are unknowingly paying attention to those thoughts. And as we discussed in chapter 2, attention just fortifies the thoughts rather than dampening them. So it is futile to control the thoughts. That is not the way to reach a tranquil mind. How about following the thoughts as some gurus suggest? I don't know what exactly they mean by following the thoughts, but even that would pay more attention to the thoughts and encourage them to proliferate. So, that may not be the right way either. Let us look at right ways of meditation. In some Buddhist meditation techniques that I will be discussing later, they neither control the thoughts nor go after them. They merely observe the current of thoughts as they get generated. They try to disassociate themselves from the thoughts and show indifference to them. That is what Buddha is supposed to have done during his last stages as his death approached. It all sounds good but raises several questions, especially when you say that there is no observer. That is what the Buddhists say. Theirs is a completely objective world with no subject. There is nothing beyond the mind. There is no observer. In that case, who is the one that is observing the thoughts? There is one more way. You neither control the thoughts nor follow them nor observe them passively. You just keep your mind busy on some other thought. While you keep your focus on some other thought, rest of the thoughts don't get the attention they need to survive. They gradually die down without any effort needed from your side. You don't have to control them. They die on their own. That is the yogic way. Patanjali calls it dharana on a chosen object. Keep thinking about the chosen object in a specific way. We will see what this specific way is as we go. So, that leaves us broadly with two types of meditations. One, completely focusing on a chosen object. Two, passive observation of thoughts. Let us look at these two forms a bit more in detail. Chapter 7 What happens when you meditate? Before you reach that ultimate state, you pass through different distinct stages. At each stage, you are aware of what is happening, even though you are oblivious of most external happenings around you. That is why Patanjali calls these stages as Samprajnata Samadhi, that is, stages of Samadhi with awareness. The mind is almost calm, but not all its activities have stopped completely yet. Patanjali talks about four such stages of Samadhi with awareness. He says, Samprajnata Samadhi can be either Vitarka dominant or Vichara dominant, or Ananda dominant or Asmita dominant. Vitarka, Vichara, Ananda, Asmita, Nurupa, Nugamat, Samprajnataha. Yoga Sutra 1.17. Let us look at these stages a bit more in detail. Chapter 9 What is the ultimate goal of yoga? Ultimate goal of yoga is liberation. But this liberation could mean different things to different people. For people like Patanjali, ultimate liberation is in attaining Kaivalya, a state in which the soul is free from all entanglements. Such a free soul blissfully abides forever without getting trapped back into the miseries of life. For the likes of Buddhists, who don't believe in the existence of soul, this liberation could mean 
cessation of endless cycles of deaths and births. According to them, no one actually takes birth nor dies, but it is just a phenomenon purely driven by causality. A new birth results as a consequence of accumulated karmic impressions and craving for a body. Liberation means stoppage of this cycle once for all. For Vedic philosophers, the culminating point of yoga is aimed at having a glimpse of the ultimate truth that evades our normal mundane perceptual capabilities. They assert that knowing that ultimate truth can bestow eternal peace. Among these, the ultimate goal of yoga as described by the Upanishad seems to be the most encompassing. They talk about some ultimate truth that can be realized by meditation or yoga. This realization is also supposed to bestow eternal peace. What is this ultimate truth realizing which one attains eternal peace? To listen to the complete audiobook, please click the link given below in the description. Also, please don't forget to subscribe to this channel to get notified on future books. Thank you.